the now. 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 The Music Biz Weekly presents the Rockstar Branding Podcast. Turn your band into a world famous brand. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Rockstar Branding Podcast. This is episode number 47, and I'm one of your hosts, Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder and the DIY Daily. And of course, I've got Michael Brandvold with me and Greg Kinn. How you guys. doing, everyone? Hi, uh, hey, how are you guys doing today? Doing excellent. Rockin'. I am ready for a rockin' podcast. <laughs> Let's do it. Today's episode is... Basically, it's this is a question for Greg, and we're just going to riff on this. This okay. is how did MTV change how you looked at yourself and your career as a rock star? Oh, that's so, a great question. I, let's just say right now, for the record books, MTV made all the difference when it came to Jeopardy. Now, interestingly enough, the breakup song, which was released in 1981, did not have a video because it was a little early for MTV. Eventually, there was a live uh, version of the video that they ran all the time. But it wasn't until Jeopardy in 1983 where we made our first concept video. And, and let me tell you, we had agonized over what to do for the video. Because at that point in time, most videos were uh, kind of like fake live. You know what right. I mean? They, they'd have a band and they'd have a be on soundstage faking a live performance with maybe some chicks uh, or maybe they'd have a couple of shots of chicks running down an alley with lingerie on, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and we didn't want to do that. And I... Why, we, wait a second, Greg. Why wouldn't you want a couple of chicks in lingerie running around <laughs> by you? Well, we were doing that in our private lives. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to keep things separate. Um, Got to separate work and pleasure, you know. You certainly do. <laughs> Hey, by the way, you know, you look at all these guys that are all horny in their old age, you know, the Howard Stearns of the world. It, the reason they're all horny is because they didn't get any back in the day. I'm not like that. I'm completely <laughs> you're, satisfied. You're very my, satisfied. Yes, my tubes are clean. I have nothing to hide. Uh, <laughs> you had a wonderful run. But getting back to MTV, at the time, most of the videos were fake live, and they just, they had a kind of that... Uh, MTV look, which was very slick. There was a lot of lasers and smoke bombs, but didn't really tell the story. We had the concept of doing a, a story video, a concept video, and it was uh, the the guy that was directing Joe Day. We had a meeting, and he said, "Well, what are you into?" And I, I said, "Well, I'm a weirdo. I'm into like, you know, zombie movies and Night of the Living Dead and Stephen King." And he said, "Don't say another word." He came back a week later with the treatment for the Jeopardy video, which I loved because it was really right up my alley. And the fun thing about it was, guys, that we were going to be doing, it was make, making a cheap horror movie because we had special effects, but they were cheesy. So we had to do little things. Like, for instance, there's a one scene where this, there's this giant snake that comes out of the ground and wraps itself around me, right? And I'm stabbing the snake and green blood is splashing up into my face well the snake was made of latex rubber and we wrapped it around me tightly and ran the film in advance so that it looked like the snake jumped out and wrapped itself around me really was it would reverse in advance cheap little ploy but it looked great on film the, the pea soup, the, the, the blood, the snake's blood was yeah. Campbell's pea soup. We got a couple of those big cans that had guys with squirt guns off screen squirting me in the face. So really, they were all, that was just two of a million little tricks that we came up with on the spot. So it was kind of like making a B-movie. But the beautiful thing about the, the Jeopardy video was it was one of the first concept videos. And when we handed it in to MTV... They were delighted to have something different to play. And one of the reasons it got so much airplay and it hit number one on MTV was because it was different than all the other videos. And it started on a, a, a trend of concept videos. You'll remember that directly after that, Michael Jackson came out with Thriller, which I felt was a direct rip of what we were doing, except that we had about an $80,000 budget and he had about a $2 million budget. Yeah. Yeah. But you couldn't have done what we did with a big budget. Half the charm was 
you know, being Roger Corman. Well, let, 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 let me ask you, Greg. So one of the comments I've heard many, many bands out of the late 70s and into the early 80s say is when MTV came around, all of a sudden the bands that didn't look good didn't get yeah. played anymore. The guys who had mutton chops and big beards, you know, all of a sudden it's like, wait yeah. a second, I don't look pretty anymore. I look great for a concert stage in front of 10,000 people, but close up on your TV, it didn't cut it anymore. So did you guys all of a sudden have that moment where you're like, wow, visually our brand has to now change and and morph into something if we want to continue on this path? Yeah, I remember the day that they fitted us for all those tuxes. I'm going, hey, we're not wearing tuxes in this video. No, 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 it's a wedding. You're supposed to be wearing tuxes. And, of course, we were heavily made up. I was a lot younger in those days. But it really did require us to think much more visually. Right. And in subsequent videos after Jeopardy, uh, let me just say that if the guy... If they had a guy in the band that didn't look good, then they would make him up to look good. So, uh, I mean, going back to the original question, I mean, the question is how did MTV change the way you approached being a rock star? Do you think that was like the, the number one thing was the, the consciousness of the visual image? I think it was. I think when most people hear the song now, they immediately go back and visualize right. the video. Well, you know, up to that point, you just heard the song. I guess you had your own video in your head. <laughs> I used to joke and say, hey, back in my day, we didn't have videos. We had to smoke dope and like just close our eyes and put headphones on and make up our own video. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me Truth add. Was, let, once you see the video, that's your visual for do, the song. Do, do you, okay. as a musician, like that? I, I At the time, I thought it was a little... Uh, it just seemed like something that was counterproductive because all of this time we've been focusing on the music and being a hard working band. And now suddenly we were focusing on the glamour aspect and gee, don't they look good? And I hope girls come to the gig tonight, but you know, you re really, you couldn't escape it. I know it was tough for other bands. I knew other bands that, that just couldn't make it on MTV because of the way they looked. And let's face it. ZZ Top found a way around that. Hot you chicks. Know, they branded themselves with the hot rods and the hot babes. Yeah. And they could they proved that you could take a bunch of guys with, you know, big old beers that look like the Smith brothers and brand them to be rock stars. So it's possible, but you you got to get creative. No, obviously today we don't have no one really has the ability to have a smash hit video the way it we did in 1983 or 1989 no. or whatever things have drastically changed yet again so as much as MTV totally reshaped the way uh, musicians approach branding and marketing themselves and the way people consume it um, well in the last seven eight ten years uh, the music industry and culture as a whole has gone through another shift obviously with social media and the web and online distribution and pirating and all this stuff. So now you said um, initially you approached M your, your you viewed MTV as kind of being like a, a necessary nuisance that maybe you had to put up with, but you accepted it and you embraced it and it, it ended up working out well for you. How with the online world, is there some parallels there in the way, like how did you first uh, approach dealing with the online world? You know, that's a really good question because there are some parallels. You know, I look at the online world right now. It's the same way that we looked at MTV in the 80s. It was the Wild West, really. Right. it was. There were no rules. We were making it up as we went along. Um, and I think marketing-wise for a young band today, when you look at what's possible now with the Internet, uh, it is, I mean, the sky's the limit. I, what I said originally still goes you know if you if what you're doing comes from the heart and it's personal and it's real you know I, I keep saying this you don't want to be doing a shtick you know I, I guess it works if you're if your whole life is like like kiss they have a shtick they stick to it that's it but the rest of us um, I think it's better to just be honest now if you're going to be online promoting your record you 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 want to take parts of you 
that nobody else can duplicate, you know, things from your heart, and you put that into the way you market the song. It may be the video, it may be the lyrics, it may be the way you look or the way you present the band. I mean, God, now things are so fractured. I mean, you could be looking at uh, videos on YouTube, and one video is like, you know, Taylor Swift, and it's like Fantasyland, and then it's Mumford. Here comes Mumford and Son. They have nothing in common, yet they're both there. Uh, and then you go, and then it, suddenly it's Lady Gaga. It's a freak show. There, I think it's always going to be like this, and the key is to find your niche that works for you from your heart because people are going to connect with you if you connect with them with a real message. If you're a, if you're a nerd, you make nerdy stuff. You know, look at Weezer. Mm -hmm. They're nerds, right? And that's, her, that's, that's their trip. So you take whatever would have been a uh, distraction 20 years ago and you make that your shtick. You make that your thing. Um, well, I think what you're, what you're tapping into there is um, – the web has enabled all of us to find our niches a lot more easily. Oh, so yeah. if you are uh, into whatever weird little thing, there's a there's an audience for that. Yeah, and so there are, there's so many people now involved on the internet that you're right. We talked about being everything being so fractured now. You listen to the radio. Here comes one song. Here's another song that has nothing to do with it. Completely different vibe. What what's the deal here? Well, the deal is that there's an audience for everything. You know what I mean? You could you could have songs of you know songs about head wounds. You know what I mean? I make a whole album, my head wound, <laughs> and, and there'd be an audience out there, and you'd have headwound.com, and uh, you know we're going to the head wounds gig, head wounds gig tonight. There's an audience for almost anything. You know, bring your bandages. In, we could invent one right now. How about incontinent rock? <laughs> I just can't hold it in when you guys play. You guys right? are so shitty. I love it. <laughs> Writing about We're that feeling that, that you get. A whole new level. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, there's, you know, we what, need what I'm, my point is there's an audience for everything out there, and your job is to find them and connect with them. And, that's, and that is part of being a musician is finding them. You can't just wait for them to find you. You actually have to actively participate online to find your niche and to do everything that you can that the way the you are discoverable yeah and 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 through the whole thing be yourself right. because people are going to respect that and they're going to be able to tell if you're a phony you know if you're not really into incontinent rock it's going to come out <laughs> yeah like if you don't wear a diaper all all the time then <laughs> hey there'll be people in 10 years that'll be wearing the diaper just to fit in i don't need this diaper but i want to be you know part of the gang <laughs> i'm shitty but i can hold it in <laughs> You're killing me, man. <laughs> oh, God. Well, that's a wrap. Let's wrap that one up. Woo! <laughs> Let's wrap that diaper up and throw it Let's in the hamper. Let's tie that one in. Podcast. Let's tie that one up and throw it in the bin. <laughs> All right, you guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, email it to your friend. Tell a buddy at the water cooler. Um, just don't shit on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Thanks, Beautiful. everyone.